Jane. I've called everyone. Oh, I know I shouldn't worry. I, I know that, but it's so late. If he'd only stay out of those nasty old caves. They're full of bats. And... Oh, I, I think I hear him now. Yes, I'll call you back. Goodbye. Darling, what's happened to you? Well, you're all covered with clay. Oh, Steve. Never felt better in my life. What's all the commotion? Where have you been? It was wonderful. We had some exciting trouble getting out today. Our entrance to the big room in the cave had been up over some mud-coated rocks of a cliff, and, and we couldn't get back that way without danger. Our fire was burning low, the bats were swooping oh, around, how horrible. and our flashlight wouldn't pierce the smoke. Then I remembered the chute, a jagged hole with wet clay lining that slanted through the limestone ledge. Well, after we found it, we all slid in the mud and soon were out in the air. Gee, it was fun. We found some unusual tufa, too. Oh. Oh, you spelunker. You have just heard a drama entitled The Homecoming of a Spelunker, and it could happen to you. We are well on our way for another excursion in science as we encounter the subject of So You Want to Live in a Cave. There's the key word to all this mystery, and the key man is Al Zink. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? I think before we progress, we might explain that our authority is Mr. Vincent J. Schaefer. And let's explain a few terms for those of you who have not yet met Tufa and Spelunker, not even in crossword puzzles. Bob, will you double for Mr. Webster and tell us what Tufa is? Tufa is porous rock formed from the deposits of streams. A stalagmite is one form of Tufa. And who or what is a Spelunker? A Spelunker is a strange, unpredictable person who likes to crawl through mud and water, squeeze through tight passageways, drop into sinkholes, and otherwise sport through the natural underground caverns of the earth. I guess some of us inherited the desire to return to caves from our ancestors who crawled in caves. We know they did, for the ancient man was not content just to live and die in a cave. He took smoking firebrands and bowls of colored clays, and on remote rocky walls made pictures of animals. At other times, he picked up the sticky mud of subterranean passageways, and molded remarkable forms of pals, both human and bestial. That was all very well and good for the primeval man, but why should modern man go poking around in dark holes? The eyes of a spelunker light up when the word passes down the line that a new passageway has been discovered. He never knows what's beyond the bend ahead, and the urge to find out must be satisfied. That urge has made men walk through 40-degree water up to their necks, and this in the dark or dim light of an unexplored cave. At the risk of seeming out of place, why? It's not unusual for a spelunker to behave thus, but this particular party was exploring the tufa dams of a cave above the Schoharie Valley near Albany, New York. The crystal clear water didn't look so deep when they waded in, but when they dropped off a ledge into the neck high water, they hadn't breath enough to do anything but continue to the next level. Unfortunately, when they dragged out of the water at the second dam, the humidity increase due to the soaking clothes caused the air to be filled with a dense fog. Visibility became zero, and the return trip was no fun since they knew what was ahead of them. By no fun, you mean no danger? That's it. Certainly would be dull. But seriously, how should anyone want to live in a cave? They were natural shelters from severe weather, predatory animals, and other discomforts. Perhaps the dread of spiders, which seems quite universal, can be traced back to those early cavern homes. You mean there are spiders in caves, too? Bob, if the caves of Europe and Asia are anything like those of America, they have a substantial population of these many-legged creatures. In many of the American caves, there is a spider population of at least one spider per square foot of space. What they live on is not at all obvious, for although they have been seen often, they have never been seen eating a meal. Most cave spiders look healthy, are quite large, and each has a web home. Each has a home. Some of us are outdone by a spider. Fine thing. There are other things in caves, too. I hate to ask, but tell me what. Daddy Longlegs. In a small cave several miles back from the escarpment of the Helderbergs... Are uh, Helderbergs cave animals, too? The Helderbergs, Bob, are mountains west of the Hudson River. Oh. And this small cave is used every winter by hundreds of daddy longlegs. Soon after the first snow comes, a visit to this cave will show the ceiling spotted with colonies of the insects. 
photographs will show a dense forest of intertwined legs. Almost invariably, one or two pale cave crickets mount guard over the hibernators. So daddy long legs hibernate in the winter. Never knew that before. But the hibernation is mild. It's not unusual for a scientific photographer to go through grotesque contortions to set up and focus a camera aimed at a cluster of daddy long legs on a cave roof, only to find that the subjects have resented the intrusion and left for more secluded parts. The word cave to me sounds synonymous with difficulty. And to many others, it's synonymous with black cats, witches, and bats. In a portion of America heavy with legend was a cave known as the Witch's Hole. Local tales told of an old crone who lived in a cabin, and among her capabilities was her reputed power to enter her cabin and suddenly appear from the woods some distance away. According to stories, a trap door was found which gave her access to a large cavern, opening into a passageway to a secluded glen. But modern spelunkers have proved the whole business false. Did they follow the cave to its end? Exactly. In order for the witch to have negotiated her alleged route, they found it necessary to wiggle through different sized openings like an, like an animated corkscrew, during which they were plastered with mud from head to foot. Her ability to get through without being covered with mud, and thus disclosing her secret, would call for a considerable degree of magic. You've referred only to the caves in New York State. Aren't there others which are much larger? Well, Bob, the caves of New York State can't be compared with the larger ones of Kentucky and West Virginia or New Mexico. Caves such as we have been discussing occur most often as channels in limestone, as enlargements along joint planes or as meandering passages that are generally the course of active or ancient underground streams. Many caves still have small streams in them. Groundwater charged with carbon dioxide passes over the rock and slowly dissolves away the lime. This dissolved matter in many instances is later precipitated in the cave as stalactites, stalagmites, pillars or flowstone lining the sides or as tufa deposits just below the mouth of the cave. Tufa often forms excellent stone replicas of leaves, moss, ferns, and other soft tissue structures, which are coated with the stony residue of a cave stream. Are stalactites limited to only the large caves? Not necessarily, but they are not common in most of the small caverns in northeastern America. One reason for this is the simple fact that in a tiny opening, there is not room for a large object. Another reason there are not large formations, even the, in the sufficiently large caves in some sections, is the irrepressible habit Americans have of collecting things, even stalactites. You mean? I mean that in most unguarded caves, tourists have not been satisfied until they broke off the biggest and best formations they could manage. I had an uncle once who said all such formations grew at a constant rate. Was he right? With all due respect, uncle was all wet. Well, yes, that too. <laughs> to proceed, some large stalactites were broken off by spelunkers in a prominent cave, and when they examined the result many years later, it was apparent that natural forces had attempted to repair the damage. It was evident, however, that the rate of growth was far from a uniform process. New growth more than a foot long had formed in one location, while alongside a second deposit had built up to only a few inches. The rate of buildup of stalagmites is, of course, directly related to the quantity of water and its dissolved minerals, which reach a particular spot and are deposited as the water evaporates. How old are most of these caves? Most American caves date back to the glacier period, which drew to a close between 10 and 20,000 years ago. At its greatest extent, most northern territory was completely covered with a thick sheet of ice. Good evidence of the ice sheet can be found as glacial scratches on some high rock ledges formed as the glacier drags stones over the bedrock, polishing and scratching it. As this ice melted, torrents of water rushed through the underground cave channels, scouring away whatever formations existed from previous more peaceful periods. A lot of debris must have been washed through the mountains. Yes, extensive deposits of debris plugged up many of these underground regions. An excellent example of glacial deposits was found recently by a spelunker. After a vertical drop of nearly 70 feet, and then a steep descent over jagged rocks for perhaps 50 feet more, 
A series of passageways were followed which led into several rooms with beautiful formations. Along one of these routes, the wall along one side consisted of a vertical face of glacial drift which had been solidified by natural cement to a hardness comparable with the solid rock wall of limestone on the other side. But tell us, to what scientific goal could a spelunker look forward? One of the things uh, which leads every spelunker into caves is the search for the remains of ancient man. It has always been an ambition to locate dry level rooms which had been occupied by early inhabitants of this continent. This possibility was given considerable impetus a few years ago when the tooth of a ground sloth was found in a cave near Schoharie, New York. Many hours were spent worming through mud and water, but no more relics were found. Further penetration of the cave was blocked by a large pillar of calcium carbonate. A craning neck and a flashlight showed the passage to continue into dark distance, but no one of the party could wiggle through the opening. Members of this group were so muddy from their escapade that they lay down in the Schoharie Creek, clothes and all, to get rid of some of the cave clay. It names a mud as far as I can see. Well, apparently it has great fascination, Bob, for the present inhabitants of caves on a permanent or visiting basis. Spiders, blind fish, crickets, toadstools, porcupines, bats, and most of all, spelunkers seem to be satisfied with their choice. Well, thanks to you, Al Zink, and to Vincent J. Schaefer of the General Electric Research Laboratory for the wealth of experience and information he gave us. Mr. Schaefer is an accomplished spelunker, a tribute we can pay with all respect. And ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like a copy of a paper by Mr. Schaefer with many details on the science of cave study and added information of value to any spelunker, drop a card to the station to which you are listening and ask for scientific paper number 255 entitled, So You Want to Live in a Cave. That's scientific paper number 255, So You Want to Live in a Cave, which you can get by addressing a card to Excursions in Science in Care of the Station. And so we approach that portion of our program dealing with queries and quandaries sent in by you, the listener, seeking the aid of our experts from the General Electric Research Laboratories. The answers to your scientific questions reflect the most advanced and accurate information obtainable by our staff members and those of other equally trustworthy institutions. After our recent discussion on caves, it's extremely appropriate that our first question today concerns bats. This little coincidence came about because we saved this question until this time. But a housewife in Albany, New York, asks how she can get rid of a bat that frequently invades her screen porch. Well, if our listener has made up her mind that the porch is too small for her and the bat, the best way to get rid of the beast is to find the way he gets in, probably through a crack in the eaves and close the opening. Bats, remember, like mice, however, can get through very small openings. Well, we'll leave the lady to transfer her bats from the porch to the belfry and progress to this question concerning another type of varmint, a frog and his song. From a rural fan comes this musical interrogation. Which member of the frog family actually sings the frog songs we all love to hear in the spring? Are they real frogs, old or young, large or small? The symphony or cacophony of spring is offered free to the air by any number of groups of frogs which make noises. But the real concerto artists are mostly peepers, or spring hylers, which live in swamps. Or you may call them tree toads, found in trees and shrubs. All of these vocalists are adults, some of whom have hibernated throughout the winter, while the others are younger rascals who have just reached the stage of mature yodeling. These singing frogs may range in size anywhere from being one inch long to good-sized granddaddy frogs. For summer campers and those lucky enough to have a cottage or cabin, we bring this one from another lady who is upset because her summer camp has been adopted by a snake who feels quite comfortable in the attic. She wants to know if any other animal or some chemical would cause it to leave or what you might suggest to frighten it. One suggestion is to close all possible means of entrance to the snake. You could do this when the reptile is out making a call. The snake probably gets in through small cracks or knot holes in the side of the building. We found no chemical which would cause the snake to depart without injuring it, and as far as frightening him goes, a human being or a cat or a dog would frighten it. Now from the housing problems of the snake, we glance at this question from a man who has a pond full of cattails and wishes to dispose of half of these possessions, uh, meaning the cattails. How may he do this? We suggest that our listener try the substance 2,4-D. Another substance, copper sulfate, or blue vitriol, as it is sometimes called, may also be used. 
A whimsical scientist suggested planting dogwood near the pond and thus chasing away the cattails, but... Uh, <clears throat> this man also wants to know if cattails grow from roots as well as from seeds. Yes, cattails do grow from roots as well as seeds. Well, before we're accused of having taken root here, let's take our departure. We urge listeners to send in more scientific questions to this program, this station. Until we hear from you, goodbye and join us again on our next excursion in science.